Hello to chapter 66 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Shark Massacre. When in the southern fishery a captured sperm whale after long and weary toil is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore, the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that until that time anchor watches shall be kept, that is, two and two for an hour, each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that, were he left so for six hours, say on a stretch, little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely about, they, their wondrous voracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades, a procedure notwithstanding, which in some instances only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case, with the Peacod's sharks, though, to be sure, any man unaccustomed to such sights to have looked over her side that night would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese and those sharks the maggots in it. Nevertheless, upon stop setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, and when accordingly Queequeg and a forecastle seaman came on deck, no small excitement was created among the sharks, for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid sea, these two mariners, darting their long wailing spades kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls, seemingly their only vital part. But in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but like flexible bows, bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures. A sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones after what might be called the individual life had departed. Killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin, one of these sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. Queequeg no care what God made him shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down. Whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but the God what made shark must be one damn engine. So that was chapter 66. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 67, titled Cutting In.